I wanted to wish my mom a happy birthday. Um, uh, today is her, her birthday, so we want to give thanks for that. And we just want to give praise and thanks for, for Jesus for giving us this day, a second Sunday um, in the celebration of his resurrection. With that, we'll begin with a, a hymn uh, sung by Carissa Meyer. Now all the vault of heaven resounds. Now all the vault of heaven resounds in praise of love that still abounds. Christ has triumphed, he is living. Sing choirs of angels loud and clear. Repeat their song of glory here. Christ has triumphed, Christ has triumphed. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. <clears throat> Eternal is the gift he brings. Therefore our heart with rapture sings. Christ has triumphed, he is living. Now still he comes to give us life. And by his presence stills all strife. Christ has triumphed, he is living. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Good morning. I'm Jeff Huff, and I'll be your liturgist this morning. We begin with a reading from Psalm 20 by Pastor Tony. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall but we rise up and stand firm. Lord, give victory to the king. Answer us when we call. A hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Amen. This morning, we will return to our recurring series titled Enough. Since October, we have been occasionally examining our secular culture's religion of enoughness. Enough good deeds, enough zero calorie, enough Christmas presents, and today in the midst of a pandemic, enough precaution. Therefore, we will meditate on Jesus' teaching in our gospel lesson about the precautions God already has taken to keep us safe. And now Jeff will lead us in the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A prayer of Solomon from 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 37 through 40. When famine or plague comes to the land, or blight or mildew, or locusts or grasshoppers, or when any enemy besieges them in any of their cities, Whatever disaster or disease may come, and when a prayer or plea is made by anyone among your people, Israel, being aware of the afflictions of their own hearts and spreading out their hands toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Forgive and act. Deal with everyone according to all they do, since you know their hearts, for you alone know every human heart so that they will fear you all the time they live in the land you gave our ancestors. Amen. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, 
We poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We observe a moment of silent reflection. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes is and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. And now you'll hear Ian sing the Kyrie. Kyrie, God, Father in heaven above, you abound in gracious love. Of all things the maker and preserver, eleison, eleison. Kyrie, O Christ our King, salvation for all you came to bring. O Lord Jesus, God's own Son, our Mediator at the heavenly throne, hear our cry and grant our supplication. Eleison, eleison. Kyrie, O God the Holy Ghost, God our faith, the gift we need the most and bless our life's last hour, that we leave this sinful world with gladness. Eleison, eleison. Let us pray. Righteous Redeemer, what you have cleansed by waters of baptism is clean. What you have purified by your blood is pure. Those you have saved by the cross are safe forever. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that as we face crises of any kind, we will always trust in your salvation. For you are Jesus Christ, the Son, our Lord. Amen. This morning, readings. A reminder of what truly protects us when we are faced with threats, whether from giants, pandemics, or unrighteousness. And now Carol will read the first lesson. The first reading is from 1 Samuel, selected verses. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. This is the word of the Lord. And now Duane will read the second lesson. The second reading is from Colossians chapter two, selected verses. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, 
which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. This is the word of the Lord. We will hear now the Alleluia in verse sung by Ian. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter, selected verses. Glory to you, O Lord. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions such as washing of cups, uh, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? And Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile him by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles him. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, the disciples asked him about the parable. Are you so dull? He asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? Where it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now the sermon message by Pastor Tony. Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. April 10th, 2010, the headline reads, A man is pulled from a train for not wearing his mask. If you watched the evening news, then you probably saw um, the footage of this on television. Now, when I watched it, the thought that went through my head as I saw this man cussing and swearing at the police officers and them tugging on him and trying to pull him as he's holding on with all of his might to the inner frame of this bus door, the question that came to my mind is, is there a point in which we are taking all of this stuff too far? Now, there is indeed a point when our obsession with contagion actually becomes its own religion. That is the religion of enough. And in this particular case, enough precaution precaution you see as our secular society faces various crises we tend to respond with enough precaution when it was shooters coming into churches the response was enough security 
when it was a hurricane? The response was getting enough water and food and gasoline and plywood for shutters. And now today, in the midst of this pandemic, the response was, well, I guess we got confused for a moment. We thought it was about having enough toilet paper. But now we understand it's enough precautionary measures, enough social distancing, enough wearing of masks, enough hand washing. But whenever we, in this religion of enoughness, endeavor to have enough, all we ever end up with is anxiety. Anxiety because we're never sure that we have enough and we realize that enough just isn't enough. So if you are anxious today, if you're feeling any anxiety, my message to you is Jesus is enough. He is enough. So allow me to cut and paste our gospel lesson from Mark chapter 7 into our current reality. We find Jesus in the grocery store or the marketplace with his 12 disciples, more than 10 people, less than six feet apart, and they're eating food with unwashed hands. Now, can you imagine the news stories about this, the tweets and, and all of the various things and complaints that people would make? Understand that the eyebrows that Jesus raised back in his time are still raised today. We can't imagine that someone would actually do this, eat this food with unwashed hands. And so with all of this criticism, here is Jesus' response. I wanna invite you all to, to look then at the Mark chapter seven passage with me again. This is from Mark chapter seven, we're gonna start at verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile him by going into him. Again, nothing outside a person can defile him. Not even the coronavirus. You see, when Jesus is talking about defiled, he isn't talking about a viral contagion. He's talking about your holiness, your righteousness, your moral purity before God. When it comes to your purity, there is no pathogen in the air or on surfaces that can make you morally impure. This passage reminds us that despite our unmasked faces and unsanitized hands, God keeps us pure. I say again, God keeps us pure. Now, first, let me say that we should certainly applaud and give thanks to the leaders of our nation, the, the civic leaders, the top minds of the center of disease and, con of control, and control. We should give them some thanks and praise for directing the public in ways that have led to fewer infections nationwide this past week. You know, praise God for that. You know, our changes and our, our social interactions and also our, our social habits seem to have made a difference, hallelujah. And still, what the authorities are telling us may decrease infections, but they do not keep you pure. They do not promise eternal salvation. It's what Jesus is telling us today in this gospel lesson is what he's telling the crowd, that is what keeps us pure and promises us everlasting life. Now, if our religion is enoughness right now, then pure to us merely means being germ free. And Perel is now the new holy water that we just can't get enough of. 
just like how the Pharisees thought by that they were holy by washing their cups and their kettles and, and all of their vessels, we today think that we are pure by merely being sanitized, by using our Perel and, and soap and water. We think that our cleaning and our disinfecting and, and distancing ourselves are righteousness. The public health guidelines have now become for us a new moral standard, a new Ten Commandments by which we judge or call into question one another's responses to the pandemic. You see, there are pressures among businesses and organizations to close their doors, cancel events, and suspend services in order to not appear irresponsible. And then there's a lot of finger pointing among heads of states and governors over who has failed to implement the proper precautions. And then yesterday, as people swarm back to reopen beaches in Jacksonville, there are those who complained on Twitter by using the hashtag Florida Morons. And even Christians are judging other Christians. Like Rick Warren, the author of Purpose Driven Life, called gathering together for worship during the pandemic dumb and unbiblical. And then there's myself. Personally, this week, in the shopping aisle of the supermarket, there were moments when I felt an attitude of self-righteousness for wearing a mask. But then a feeling of con a condensation or condescension towards people in the store who weren't wearing a mask. I found myself saying things like, hey, how do they get in here? Or they're not obeying the rules or how inconsiderate. But as we apply Mark 7 to our pandemic story, we hear Jesus reminding us that it isn't our sanitation. It isn't our precautions, but God who keeps us pure. It is God who keeps us pure. Now, when Jesus is our religion, COVID-19 isn't what makes us impure. When Jesus is our religion, it isn't the contagion we breathe in, but the sinful thoughts, words, and deeds that come out of us that make us impure. If you have your Bibles open to Mark 7, in verse 20, you will see what Jesus is teaching about this, about what makes us impure. Verse 20 says, he went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit. Lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. You see, it isn't the sin. It really is the sin coming out of us that makes us impure before God. No doubt, the coronavirus can kill us. It can kill us if we don't take the necessary precautions. But it is sin, not COVID-19, that will kill us eternally. No sin can resist, can stand up against what God has given us. So it is sin, the sin that comes out of us, that is man's greatest problem. I wish I had a better appreciation of this teaching back in 2006 on a mission trip in Guatemala as I was ministering to people who were picking out what they could get for daily life from a landfill. So on April 5th, I wrote in my journal, just outside the walls, of the dump, we stand by a little red pickup truck 
affectionately named Rodrigo, and hand out juice in knotted plastic bags and styrofoam bowls of beans and rice. I am given the task of helping people wash their hands. I ladle water from a bucket with a plastic bowl and pour it onto the outstretched palms of those who have lined up for food. They soap their hands, I rinse them with another bowl full of water, and then after that, others dry them, and then another sanitizes them with Pharrell. Frantically lading, I never see the faces of those who have come to feed, but only the hands. And like the faces, they tell each person's story. Some are smooth, some are rough, some are youthful, some are old, some are covered with dirt, some are large and some small. One boy who entered the line has only stubs for fingers on his left hand. He whines to mom, reluctant to hold it out to me. I wash it with gentle care. The journal entry ends. You know, washing people's hands of their germs was truly a noble and prudent effort. It was a good thing to clean and wash their hands before they came to eat. But that by itself was not enough. The hands that we wash will become dirty again. And the hearts and minds that have sinned are yet unclean. See, what we were there doing by washing their hands and giving them food was hoping that they would come to hear about a Jesus Christ, a God who keeps them pure. So this morning, my message to you is this, that God keeps us pure. And I would like to share with you four ways, four ways in which God keeps us pure. And you can write these down. But the first way that God keeps us pure is with the body of Christ. The body that took up all our infirmities. The body that was pierced for our transgression. The body by whose wounds we are healed. God keeps us pure with the body of Christ. But he also keeps us pure with the blood of Christ. The blood of the Passover lamb on the doorpost that keeps us safe from the plague. The blood of a new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. The blood that cleanses our consciences from acts that lead to death. God keeps us pure with the body and the blood of Christ. But thirdly, he keeps us pure with the water of baptism. The water that now saves you, according to 1 Peter chapter 3. Not with the removal of dirt from the body, but with the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It is the baptismal water that saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. All these precautions, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the water, the baptism God gives us by his word. And so number four, God keeps us pure with his word. It is the word of God that forgives our sins and declares us pure. It is the word of God that is made flesh and delivers to us the body and blood of Christ in the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper and in the water of baptism. It is the word of God that gives us faith to believe that Jesus is God and has come into our pandemic, our pandemic of sin, and given us his body, his blood, and the water to clean us. It was later during that mission trip in Guatemala that God did more than just wash the hands of the people. He also purified their hearts and minds when I had the opportunity to preach the word of God with a crowd of people there. A crowd of people 
that did not know where their next meal was coming from or how they would get by the next day. I was able to tell them about how God provided Abraham with a sacrifice so that Isaac did not have to die. Well, God also provided his son and gave us his body and blood and the water of baptism by which we are saved. I, through the word of God, was able to give them enough. Therefore, I encourage all of you to remain in God's word during this pandemic, to continue to worship with us, to read your Bibles at home, to pray. And in it, you'll find of all of God's precautions to keep you pure. The religion of enough leaves us feeling anxious as we face this current situation. The amount of precaution against the infection becomes our measure of holiness instead of our purity that we have before God. We're more concerned with protecting ourselves from germs that only kill the body than from the sin that condemns both body and soul to hell. So as we anxiously put on our mask and gloves as precaution, wondering if that will be enough, Remember David from our Old Testament reading this morning. It wasn't the king's armor that gave him victory over the giant, but the name of the Almighty God. Remember, our giant isn't a microscopic organism, but our sinful thoughts, words, and deeds that defile us. Against this, God has given us his body as our mask and gloves. He's given us Jesus' blood as the serum to fight the infection. And God has given us his word, not to judge or criticize or condemn us, but to forgive us, renew us, lead us and strengthen us, that we might delight in his will and walk in his ways to the glory of his name. So if you are anxious today, Remember that God keeps you pure. He keeps you pure with the precautions that he has brought us in Jesus Christ, his body, his blood, and the baptism in his name. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Each week I have been offering an opportunity for confirmands to to share with us their essays um, in how they see God alive in creation. And if I can get her online, hopefully, um, we'll have Kashmir Levy share her essay with us this morning. We'll move on to Jeff with prayer. Okay. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And Lord, Father God, we give thanks that through Christ, we have a promise. We have a promise that you hear us and that you love us and that you save us. And so today we lift up to you uh, those among us who are hurting and suffering in any way. We pray for, for Pamela and her family in health, but then also struggles with jobs. We also pray for Peter, a member who has um, contracted the con coronavirus. We pray for Renee, who is in the hospital battling an infection and pneumonia. We lift up to you Marie Shaw, who has suffered many deaths in her family as a result of the epidemic. We pray for my father, Ken, who sustained some broken bones when a tree fell in his front yard. We lift up to you Ashley, who 
as of April 17th, was expecting a baby to be born. I pray for my mom and her birthday and ask that you would bless her. And we also pray for uh, our Savior Lutheran school parent, Nick Rossi, who has a growth on his kidney. And we also pray for Barry and ask that she would be with him as doctors uh, try to preserve his leg. And Lord, we pray for our world. We pray for the leaders within it, the healthcare workers on the front line, and all those who are right now being cared for in the midst of the, the pandemic. And ask that you would have mercy on us. Bring us healing and restore us, Lord, uh, quickly. We pray for all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And at this time, Sam will sing the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now Pastor Tony will give us the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. This morning, I would like to uh, give thanks to the Lord for uh, those who were in his service. We had um, soloists uh, Chris Meyer and Sam Cucci, liturgist Jeff Huff, and Ian Johnson as a cantor, readers Carol, and Dwayne Srot. We had uh, uh, Kashmir Levy who wanted to give her essay. We'll probably have her come on a different Sunday. And then for technical support, want to give thanks to John Strang and Pamela King and Lacey Bonetto. And then just for announcements today, just want to let you know that um, uh, the current plan is to, to continue to worship this way um, uh, for next Sunday as well. Um, uh, you'll be able to use the same phone number and access codes to dial in at 10 a.m. Um, we continue to pray about, um, as this the closure goes on, uh, ways that we can continue to enhance our worship experience. So uh, we pray for that. But more than anything, we're just praying that we can get back to church as soon as possible. Uh, also, just want to uh, give thanks to all of you for continuing to be faithful in your contributions and your giving. It's It's been amazing. Um, so um, uh, we come to church, we find things slipped under the door. It's It's interesting. Uh, so uh, I continue to uh, to give and and also to share your love um, to to Christ uh, through your offerings. And um, this Wednesday, I'm going to attempt to have a Bible study uh, with the Bible Brunch group um, at 10 a.m. by using uh, the Zoom platform. So um, if you're interested in being a part of that, uh, uh, let me know if you would just email me or email the church somehow, and then I'll see if I can get you an invite. Um, but everyone else who's in the group regularly, I'm going to try to follow up with you and give you the information you need to, to log in, and then we'll try that. So uh, we are going to uh, keep trying to move forward, keep getting the word out there in the midst of our closure. But um, thank you for being um, uh, the ministers to your families where you are. And um, we look forward to uh, to hearing um, uh, hearing you and, and uh, being with you again next week. And so now we close with a hymn by Carissa. My faith looks up to thee, the Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. Now hear me while I pray, 
take all my guilt away. Oh, let me from this day be wholly thine. While life's dark maze I tread, and griefs around me spread, be thou my guide. Bid darkness turn to day, wipe sorrow's tears away, nor let me ever stray from thee aside. Thank you, Sam. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be to God.